So we're good? We're good. OK. OK, good morning. My speech today will be about the Arctic region and the Lomonosov Ridge, as announced. So the Arctic region presents an interesting case in the context of our discussion of territorial disputes. Under international law, the North Pole and the region of the Arctic Ocean around it do not belong to any state. That said, that said eight coastal Arctic states each have a jurisdiction over a portion of the Arctic. Now, if you look at the map, you see the countries adjacent to the region. It's Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the US. Uh, research and other activities in the region are monitored by the Arctic Council, which was established by the Standing Committee of Parliamentarians of the Arctic Region, or SPAR. The committee deals with issues such as shipping possibilities, research and education, and climate change, etc. The committee meets about three, four times a year, each time in a different Arctic country. In 2019, the committee met in Ottawa, and I had the pleasure and the honor to be one of the interpreters during the meeting. Okay, so the interesting uh, distinction here is we said that the Arctic is not owned by any state, but it has a jurisdiction over a portion of the Arctic. So the question here is, of course, what's the difference? And um, considering how many times I came across this ownership versus jurisdiction distinction when I was preparing the presentation, you would think that there would be some kind of explanation or a definition what that means. Well, there was none. I couldn't find any coherent explanation or a clear definition. And apparently, in the legal tradition, the distinction between ownership and jurisdiction has been blurry for centuries with respect to land. So to own a land, it's not the same uh, as having a jurisdiction over this uh, piece of land. But for our purposes, the relevant fact is that each of the Arctic states has exclusive rights to explore and use a portion of the Arctic region as they see fit. OK, so who determines jurisdiction and how is jurisdiction determined? Now, um, in 1994, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, came into force. This convention clarifies how and to what extent a country can claim sovereignty over waters extending from its shores, and that includes in the Arctic. This convention also gives countries exclusive rights to natural resources within 200 nautical miles of their coastlines. So how is jurisdiction determined when it comes to water? So if you look at this map, there are relevant um, territorial components, so to speak. So on the left, we have land, obviously, but we're not interested in it for the purposes of uh, this presentation. But then to the right, we have various water zones that are demarcated re relative to the baseline. And the baseline, as you see, is a mean low water mark. Uh, in other words, it marks where the water line is during low tides on average. Now, on the left of the baseline, you see internal waters. Internal waters include rivers, streams, bays, etc. Now, when we move to the right of the baseline, and this is the um, A zone on the map, the A zone covers territorial seas. The territorial seas are the waters on the outside of the baseline that extend for 12 nautical miles or 14 land miles or 22 kilometers. Territorial seas are considered the sovereign territory of the state, just like its land. Now, we mo keep moving for, uh, further into the open sea to the right of the baseline. Uh, zone B. Uh, zone B is... Um, not zone B, sorry, we will skip zone B on the map. We will go over to zone C. Zone C is exclusive economic zone or EEZ. So the exclusive zone 
extends for 200 nautical miles from the baseline. And within these limits, the state has, uh, the state has special rights to explore, extract, and use any available marine resources. And then beyond the exclusive zone, lie international waters. The waters and seabed in the international waters are considered to be heritage of all mankind. And any activity in international waters is regulated by the UN International Seabed Authority. In the case of the Arctic, international waters cover the area above the Arctic Circle. Now, if you go to uh, area D, zone D on the map, it says continental shelf. Now, the continental shelf is an important concept for our discussion here. This is a portion of the ocean floor within 200 nautical miles offshore that is a natural extension of the land that belongs to the coastal state in question. But then we have, beyond the continental shelf, we have an extended continental shelf. The extended continental shelf is the portion of the ocean floor that goes beyond the continental shelf or beyond the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. Now, for most of the human history, no one cared about the extended continental shelf zone. Uh, all you could do at best is reach that distant point in the ocean and maybe pass through it. But once offshore exploration become a became a possibility, the extended continental shelf became subject of territorial disputes under the UNCLOS as countries try and gain access and exclusive rights to natural resources within the seabed. Okay, so going back to the Arctic now, speaking of natural resources, it is estimated that up to 25% of the world's remaining oil and gas resources are located within the seabed of the Arctic region. There are also significant mineral deposits. And there is a number of disputed areas in the Arctic, including portions of the ocean floor. And one of such disputed areas is the Lomonosov Ridge, which I'm going to talk about in detail. So what is the Lomonosov Ridge? So if you look at the map, you can see the dark blue line that stretches across the uh, North Pole, right in the middle. So this is a continental crust. This is a vast underwater mountain range in the Arctic Ocean. The ridge runs from the continental shelf of Siberia in Russia towards Greenland in Denmark and Nunavut in Canada. Now, I tell you, this thing is huge, really. It stretches for over 1,700 kilometers between the new Siberian islands and the Ellesmere Island, which is part of the Nunavut land in Canada. So the width of the Lomonosov Ridge varies between 60 and 200 kilometers, and the height varies approximately between 3.3 and 3.7 kilometers above the seabed. So the foot, uh, the base of this mountain ridge, uh, if you please, is located at the depth of 4.2 kilometers. So the minimum depth of the ocean above the ridge is about 500 meters. In other words, if you want to reach the highest peak, you have to give, uh, you have to dive 500 meters deep. Now the ridge divides the Arctic basin into the Eurasian basin and the Amerasian basin. The Lomonosov Ridge was first discovered by the Soviet expedition in 1948. In 1954, the scientists published a map that showed the newly discovered ridge. It was named after Mikhail Lomonosov, the Russian mathematician and naturalist who lived in the 18th century and who apparently predicted the existence of such a mountain ridge in the Arctic. Before 1948, it was uh, widely believed that the ocean floor in this region was just one vast plain basin. And to this day, by the way, this area remains one of the most poorly charted on the planet. 
Now, the Lomonosov Ridge promptly became subject of a territorial dispute between three Arctic nations. So you can see on the map uh, the three nations that are adjacent you know, geographically to the ridge. So first of all, it's Russia, of course, they discovered the ridge. Denmark and Canada. Each of those countries assert that the Lomonosov Ridge is an extension of their own continental shelf. So they all claim that it should be regarded as their extended continental shelf. Now, Denmark claims that the ridge is an extension of its autonomous territory of Greenland. Russia asserts that it's an extension of the Siberian archipelago Franz Joseph Land. And Canada claims that it's an extension of the Ellesmere Island in Nunavut. Now, it's all very well and good to make claims and assertions, but on what grounds and how can a coastal country claim a portion of the seabed as its extended continental shelf? And what is the claiming procedure? According to the UNCLOS, states have 10 years from the date of ratification to make claims to an extended continental shelf. They also must present to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, it's a, another UN uh, body, geological evidence that their shelf extends beyond the 200 nautical miles limit. What is the evidence? Well, the evidence could be anything, could be samples of sediment from the ocean floor, pieces of rock, etc. If such a claim is deemed valid, then uh, it gives the country exclusive rights with respect to this portion of the seabed and the resources below it. So what was happening or has been happening with this particular territorial dispute? Russia ratified the UNCLOS in 1997 and submitted its claim in 2007. Then uh, there has been some, there had been some time before Canada uh, got on board. Canada ratified the convention in 2003 and submitted claim in 2013. And then finally, Denmark ratified the convention in 2004 and submitted its claim in 2014. So since 2014, or basically since 2007, uh, ever since Russia uh, submitted its claim, scientists from each country obtained and analyzed water, sediment, rocks from around the ridge and chunks of the ridge itself, and then submitted their research to the commission in order to prove that the ridge is, in fact, a natural extension of their continental shelf. However, it is difficult to assess this evidence how can the commission be sure that it really comes from the ridge and not from some other area? The burden of proof in this case is on the country that's making the claim. And even we put, if we put aside the possibility of cheating, even a conscientious ge geologist may not always be sure that what he is looking at is the material that uh, came from the ridge itself and did not come from somewhere else. For example, from drifting ice sheets that tend to carry around uh, pieces of stones and, and drop them around as they drift. Not to mention that it is extremely, ex extremely difficult to obtain any material from uh, a mountain range, which is submerged beneath hundreds of meters of water to begin with. Uh, and so I imagine it will be a long time until this territorial dispute is settled. Now, there is a curious twist to this story. Uh, the US did not ratify the UNCLOS. It has not ratified it to this day. And even if it did, it would be very difficult for them to claim any piece of the ridge considering the geological, uh, ge the geographical location, sorry. So if you look at the map where Alaska is uh, relative to the ridge, it would be quite a stretch, no pun intended, to uh, for the Americans to claim any uh, jurisdiction over it. But of course, the US wouldn't be the US, uh, as we know them, if they could stay out of any dispute. So they had to put in their two cents and say that the Lomonosov Ridge is a mid-ocean ridge and thus not an extension of any state's continental shelf. 
I cannot assess the validity of this argument, um, obviously, because I don't have sufficient knowledge of geology and international maritime law, but this is what they're saying. Perhaps this is just a way of uh, saying, well, if we can have it, no one shall have it. So the dispute has been going on since 2013, as I said, when the second country, Canada, submitted its claim to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. And as I said, it is likely that it is not going to be resolved anytime soon. And as the Arctic Sea is melting, offshore drilling and mining become, becomes possible in more and more areas and more and more resources become accessible, I'm sure we will be seeing more territorial disputes in the region that by definition does not belong to any state. Thank you.